Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and this week at SpaceX can truly be described with the word awesome. And I'm not just using that in this sort of lame American way, I'm talking about the literally filled with awe looking at the monstrous construction of Starship and Super Heavy. You know, many key people are skeptical as to whether this thing can truly deliver what it works, but it has, they have stacked it for at least an hour, and it is taller than the Saturn V. It is an absolute monster of a, a vehicle. And yeah, this was something that happened just in the last week. They finished out the vehicles as much was, as was necessary so they could be rolled to the pad and perform this fit check. They have a landing structure, or a, sorry, a launch structure, which consists of the, this large ring with like movable arms that come down to support the bottom of the vehicle. Um, and they fold out, fold back up during launch. The the booster itself, it rolled out with 29 engines on it, and it seemed that they fitted these engines overnight, although it's clear that they weren't truly integrated into the vehicle because they're being taken back off now. One of the things that we saw is a photograph from Elon showing the booster from below, and you could see that some of the engines had white interiors in their nozzles, showing that they had never been test fired. Now, I think in theory they can do things where they swap out nozzles, but I think they basically rolled the or moved the booster engines straight to Boca Chica, put them on the booster, and now they'll be taking them off and sending them off to McGregor for actual testing and validation. The booster also has four grid fins, and this is the first time we've seen this on a super heavy launch vehicle. Now the Falcon 9 has grid fins as well, it has four of them, and they're arranged at 90 degree angles around each other, and that allows them to guide the vehicle aerodynamically to its landing site. But on Super Heavy, they've made a few changes. First of all, these are monster, like, three-ton stainless steel grid fins. They're absolutely humongous. Um, secondly, Unlike the Falcon 9, these ones do not fold in on ascent. They're fixed all the way out. They still roll left and right. And on Falcon 9, they're driven by hydraulics. On Super Heavy, they're currently driven by motors and batteries from Tesla vehicles, which obviously makes sense. Um, the other thing is that they're not at 90 degrees to each other. They're in pairs, 60 degree apart, opposite each other. And that has the effect of giving them more control authority in one axis at the expense of control authority in another axis. And the thing is, during the descent, it's maintaining this sort of glides angle as it's you know trying to head towards the target. So it needs more control in that axis and less control at uh, you know yawing or rolling. So. I can see why they've done this and it, it makes sense. But what I really want to talk about is the Starship. So this is Starship number 20. Yeah, Booster 4, Starship 20, 420. Gold figure. Uh, <laughs> again, it's the first Starship where we've seen the three fixed uh, vacuum engines on there. And again, some of those engines that we saw from below have white interiors indicating they haven't been test fired. They've already been taken off and I believe they're gonna get fired soon. More interestingly, we got a really good look at a near complete thermal protection system. So the thermal protection system on Starship is absolutely critical to Starship doing what it, it plans. Starship wants to be a rapidly reusable system and it needs a thermal protection system which needs almost no maintenance. So SpaceX have already developed a working heat shield for their Dragon spacecraft, but it is a different beast entirely. The Dragon capsule, it returns from space, lands in the water, and then goes off to a factory to be refurbished and the heat shield replaced. Because they're replacing the heat shield, they use an ablative heat shield. They use something called PICA-X, Phenolic Impregnated Carbon Ablator. And the ablator part, what it is, is there's a the resin, the phenolic resin that makes up this heat shield. When it gets hot due to the re-entry heating, it breaks down and creates gas. And that gas comes out through the surface and it provides a protective layer. And because of this, they can get away with a much thinner and lighter heat shield. Now Starship, on the other hand, is supposed to be rapidly reusable. That is the dream, that this thing can land, it can have a quick inspection, and be put back on top of a launch vehicle and head straight back to space. And that means 
you can't afford to replace the entire heat shield every type. So you need to use a, an insulating type heat shield that can handle the very high temperatures without breaking down. And the closest thing that we've seen to that is the Space Shuttle. And the Space Shuttle had a pretty bad reputation for its heat shields. Like it was eternally a problem. And indeed they almost, they lost one vehicle because the heat shield was damaged and they almost lost at least a couple of others. Uh, the heat shield needed a lot of inspection and replacement between flights. So since the Space Shuttle had such problems, how do we think that SpaceX can do the same thing with Starship but get rid of all the problems? Well, first of all, there's a few things that uh, are on SpaceX's side. First of all, the Space Shuttle was mounted on site, side on to a tank, and that tank had flecks of foam and ice, and those would fall off and impinge on the bottom surface, which is where your heat shield is. Like, in retrospect, it would have made more sense to mount the Space Shuttle upside down on the tank, so that the top of the shuttle would be getting damaged by this stuff. But, you know, these are the kind of things you learn after you've flown for a while. SpaceX don't have this problem with Starship because Starship sits on top. The other thing is that the Space Shuttle had a very complex geometry and the complex geometry meant that it needed lots of different tile designs to cover the entirety of the vehicle. They had, to, If they had a tile that needed replaced, they had to go and get that exact tile from the thousands of different designs and make sure it was inserted in there. Um, there's other problems that the Space Shuttle had that uh, it used aluminium, which had you know, greater expansion than uh, the stainless steel that we'll be seeing on Starship. Um, but yeah, the, the, and the other thing is that Starship can afford to get warmer underneath or hotter because it's stainless steel, whereas the shuttle had an aluminium structure underneath. So Starship's much simpler geometry means that the majority of the tiles are these identical hexagonal designs. And you know, to get an idea of how big these things are, they're about the size of dinner plates. I think they're about you know, 12 inches, 30 centimeters across. And they are very easy to apply to the side of the, the structure. So you're not going in and applying strain isolation pads and then glue and then spacers and then supports and then the tile you're literally going up and there's mounting pins that have been pre-placed on there. There's a robot that goes in and welds on these mounting pins with little uh, spring clips in their head and you basically just push the tile on and there are little holes in the tile with metal brackets inside them. And these will clip on and one of the nice things is that when it's mounted there's actually some play in these holes and because they use three of them the tile can actually respond as the structure moves underneath it so it's not like uh, the space shuttle where they had to have these fabric isolation pads to you know stop the flexing from popping the tile off it's really the, it has a lot of freedom to move there is actually a pad underneath, which we believe is some kind of ceramic wool design. It's probably made of silica or alumina fibers. It'll probably handle you know, temperatures of a thousand degrees Celsius quite easily, but it's not like a primary heat shield by any means. If you lose a tile, I wouldn't rely on this to give you a significant amount of protection. So anyway, yeah, a lot of the tiles just pop on like that. The biggest thing is that you have to make sure that they're close, as close together as possible so that you minimize the amount of heat coming through these gaps, but not so close that when the vehicle is in motion that they start banging together and potentially breaking. So there are areas where they need to have, you know, slightly irregular patterns. First of all, the nose cone, that is a complex structure because it curves and you know, tapers towards a point. So they have a bunch of different strategies for slowly shrinking these rings as they go up. Uh, the wings, or sorry, the fins, those have a whole bunch of very specific shapes on them and they're being filled in right now. Now, only half of Starship is being tiled. The back end is only going to get plasma from the you know trail. It's going to get like reflected heat from the radiate the thermal radiation. So the stainless steel is actually quite good at reflecting that, and that's what they'll use. Now on the space shuttle, you'll notice that the bottom of it is black because they wanted it to radiate heat efficiently. 
the top of it is white because most of the heat was coming in by thermal radiation and so they wanted it to reflect as much of that as possible. That's why the bottom of the shuttle is black. And the same is true on Starship. The bottom is going to be black because it's going to be re-emitting re as much thermal radiation as possible and the top is going to be reflecting. So anyway, the majority of the tiles are added via this pin method. And it's interesting to note that once they're attached, they can't be removed from the other side. We've seen them taking them off and they have to go in with a drill and use like a coring drill bit to get access to the clips so that they can then pull them off and replace them with new ones. Now near the front, we've also seen that they're not using pin mounts. They're essentially gluing these things straight down. It looks like the glue is red, so that's consistent with what they used on the shuttle. So there's that on the nose cone. The other place where they are doing direct gluing appears to be along the, the interface on the, on the wings. So the fins have this hinge mechanism where they need to be able to rotate and you don't want to have a gap in there. So there's a cylindrical shape here which has a bunch of tiles in it and they're going to have to have all sorts of seals here to try and make sure that the hot gas doesn't flow in there and potentially damage anything, any of the actuators. There is like mounting hinges at the top. That's going to be a difficult one. And Elon has actually talked about using transpiration cooling. The original plan when they announced Starship was becoming stainless steel was they originally talked about transpiration cooling. And that's where you try to get the insulating effect that the ablator has. But instead of having a chemical breakdown, you literally take your methane fuel supply or your oxygen, it's methane probably, blow that through tiny pores in the skin and it forms an insulating layer and protects you. I think that was dropped because it's much more complex and it may actually take more mass to do this. But there are places where it could be useful. It could definitely be useful where you've got uh, moving parts near these hinges and you can blow in high pressure fuel and just protect the protect these from high temperature plasma going in. Now there's one other thing that helps Starship compared to say the Space Shuttle or the X-37 which are reusable vehicles with reusable heat shields and that is the fact that Starship is just so darn big. So there's a basic factor in re-entry aerodynamics called the, the radius of curvature. So blunt bodies are the way to go for re-entry because the blunter your body, right, the, or the further away the stagnation point is. And the stagnation point is basically where you've got this shock wave that is formed just in front of the body. And there, the speed of the incoming air has gone from like hypersonic speeds down to basically the speed of the vehicle and it forms the shock wave at some distance from the surface and that's where most of your heat is. So you want that to be as far away from the surface as possible. And the bigger your radius of curvature, the further away your stagnation point, uh, your shock wave gets. So by having Starship be so large, this really helps it a whole lot compared to something like very small, like the X-37B, which is absolutely tiny. But you know, Starship isn't just a simple cylinder, it has other complex geometry. And when you have changes to the shape, this can do all sorts of interesting things in terms of generating shock waves, generating hot spots, and they will have done a lot of simulations to make sure they have the right amount of thermal protection system where they expect these spots to be. They will do simulations in hypersonic wind tunnels, they will do like com computational fluid dynamics to try to understand before they fly this, but flight will be the ultimate test and there's a lot of things that could go wrong. I mean, first of all, you know, if there's any damage to the heat shield at all, they could lose the entire vehicle during descent and they would like to know how. One way is to have instrumentation like thermocouples across the surface to measure the temperature in different locations. They could actually have cameras like inside the tanks looking at the inside surface because literally the outer wall of the tanks is the surface of the vehicle. So that could actually give them some clues. Uh, but, you know, in terms of damage, I think it's actually more likely to get damaged on ascent because max Q typically is the highest dynamic pressures that a vehicle will see. That was true of the space shuttle. Like it was more likely to, it was getting higher like aerodynamic pressures on ascent than they did during descent because 
if you think about it, they were flying this sort of like an aerodynamic vehicle. And if they fall down lower, your dynamic pressures, the force of the atmosphere gets higher. But since you can use the lift, you can avoid that happening and keep the pressures at a low manageable level. So yeah, it, if there's going to get damaged, most likely to happen during on ascent, where we might see it, rather than descent, where we, we might not see it. I mean, you know, if I was like an engineer on this project, I would uh, I would build a CubeSat, right? That would pop out of the rear, out of the skirt, fly backwards with a camera on it, and then have the Starship do a roll around so we could actually observe tile damage before descent. I think that would be a cool idea, right? But you know, that's uh, I think that would probably take them time to develop, but it would be interesting nevertheless. And you know, this is something that was talked about with the space shuttle during the early launches. They apparently wanted to use um, US photo reconnaissance satellites to actually observe the heat shield on the space shuttle. And they're supposedly, they delayed the launch or had to match the shuttle's launch window to the capabilities of this satellite. Um, <laughs> It would be cool if uh, they would do that with Starship, but you know, everything is in flux, everything is moving. Obviously SpaceX are running very hard towards getting this vehicle launched, but the thing that is gonna limit them most likely is getting the FAA to complete its environmental review because they need to make sure that their site is compliant. They've gone and scaled it up from an initial plan to launch Falcon rockets to now launching big Falcon rockets. <laughs> right? Or Starship. So anyway, yeah, it's been a marvellous week. There's been so many amazing photos that have come out of this and I have I've just been glued to all of these. I, I really, once again, thanks to everybody down there that is are getting these amazing photos. And also, you know, Everyday Astronaut, apparently he's just published like part one of a three-part interview with Elon. And... Uh, Elon just just talking, talking, talking and telling us all sorts of fascinating little things. And the problem is sometimes he'll say, you know, Tim will say something and Elon will start thinking it over in his head and saying, oh, maybe we shouldn't do that. Oh, no, we can't do it. it like, it's almost like he's, he's designing ideas in his head. Like, uh, yeah, Elon's not always the best person to do presentations, but the fact that he's just talking... Uh, actually lends this uh, a great, uh, wonderful authenticity. It's quite enjoyable. Uh, and I wish them the best of luck with this uh, whenever it happens. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.